Thank you very much, Dr. Romeo, Dr. Maud, and uh, as well as, uh, as Michelle for helping to get all this organized. So this is something that's near and dear to me because I think it's something that um, I began to appreciate very heavily as I came into a baseball world. I, my background actually originally back in 2003 to 2005 was actually much more in soccer and basketball. In the basketball world, we you know come to expect seven foot tall guys all being very kyphotic as they stoop over to look at people that are much shorter than them. And when I came to this extension rotation sport um, of overhead throwing athletes, we started to see much more athletes who actually presented with this this hyperextended thoracic spine. So what we see is uh, something that actually piggybacks nicely on what our previous presentation noted with respect to Dr. McGill's work about spine uh, endurance being much more important than spine motion. And really that's uh, pertaining particularly to the lumbar spine where these are larger segments that are not well conditioned for rotation. So when we start to look at these degrees of rotational freedom, uh, we recognize that if you get too much motion in your lumbar spine, that's not ideal. But our thoracic spine is very much equipped for heavy rotation. So if we look at all the research on, on pitching and, uh, and hitting, we see a lot of the forces generated from the ground up through the lower half and transferred through a stable core to allow for good motion through the thoracic spine um, and subsequently, you know, obviously onto the arm and to the baseball in some capacity. What we do realize though is that there are some adaptations that take place in a sport like baseball, we push the limits of thoracic extension and rotation. And here are some examples, right? So first off, the spine and the rib cage tell the scapula where to go. It's this concept of regional interdependence where we may see knee problems in someone who has a stiff hip or a stiff ankle. Um, these same kind of system of checks and balances are in place in the upper extremity. The scapula in turn tells the humerus where to go. We want the, the shoulder blade to go where the arm goes and vice versa. And then the humerus delivers the rest of the arm, which dictates where the hand goes. And that governs a huge portion of athletic performance in everyday life, whether we're a professional pitcher trying to throw 95 or a grandma look, reaching for a glass on the shelf. Um, and when we look at, you know, kind of two broad categories, we have, we have pitching and we have hitting, right? So in pitching, having enough thoracic extension and rotation allows for effective hip shoulder separation and allows the arm to settle into a good arm action at layback. And we'll show this in a second with a couple of pictures, but with hitting, when you have enough thoracic extension and rotation, you can allow hip shoulder separation to take place so that the arms can lag behind. This does a few things. It keeps the bat in the zone longer to give uh, hitters adjustability, but it also can be very crucial for protecting hitters against batter shoulder on that front shoulder, where if they get fooled on a changeup, instead of just selling out for aggressive horizontal adduction on that front shoulder, they have enough thoracic extension to not rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. And then lastly, we're talking about hitters. Um, adequate thoracic flexion and rotation delivers the scapula and in turn the arm when it comes to hitting outside pitches. But for pitchers, this is equally important for actually getting to a good ball release position. So we look at Jacob deGrom, a guy who exceeds the, you know, kind of the passive restraints in the front of the hip. But what we have to appreciate is as him as a right-handed pitcher, as his pelvis is rotating uh, counterclockwise towards the plate, his torso actually is still rotating clockwise. He has not hit the point of maximal external rotation. So this is where thoracic extension really matters. It allows him to create that separation, to drive some scapular posterior tilt and set himself up for good layback um, in an ideal arm position during maximal external rotation. When we take it a step further, hitters do the same thing. This is, this is Trout and, and this is a scenario where it's presumably he's adjusting to an off-season pitch because he's maxed out most of his positive move. And what's going to happen next is the pelvis will rotate again counterclockwise towards the pitcher while the torso remains back thanks to thoracic rotation. And what we know is that there are varying levels of hip shoulder separation that take place. We know golfers tend to have the most, pitchers have less, and then hitters have even less because they're ad adapting to whatever pitch is thrown to them. But the point is that that stretch is very, very important, right? This is also why we see a lot of oblique strains on the lead side, right? Because that torso is stretching maximally while the hips are going this way. And there's naturally a pull, particularly if you have an athlete who's, who's very hyperextended through that lumbar spine because they lack good anterior core stiffness. But we have to think about the alternative as well. This is Max Scherzer in the All-Star game back in 2017. And Max is a guy who, who tries to stay on the baseball a long time to throw his change up, right? And what we realize is that adequate thoracic flexion drives scapular upward rotation 
and in turn, shoulder in turn rotation and pronation, right? We have a lot of scenarios where baseball takes us to the exact opposite early in the delivery. We have to be able to reverse that curve to be able to get to a good ball release position. The same is true. This is Bryce Harper hitting a home run where he's very out front, right? And he may pull this to right field, but you realize that he actually has to have thoracic flexion to deliver the scapula around the rib cage. So if you track the inferior medial border of his scapula, it's wrapping around to his armpit via good serratus anterior recruitment. Now, with that said, what we often expect to see is this classic kyphotic posture. We assume kids sit in school all day, they're staring at computer games and video games and, and cell phones. And we also, in our mind, have this perceptive or perception of what we've seen in all these adult populations who have sat at computers for 30 years. What we're actually probably seeing a lot more is this. I, I wouldn't be surprised if 60% of major league pitchers are actually very flat through their thoracic spine. They've lost that good convex concave relationship between the scapula and the rib cage. So we may look at these individuals like this and say, that's a raging scapular dyskinesis. We see something wrong with the train, when in reality, that actually may be a very neutral scapular positioning. And in reality, what happened, the rib cage has not filled up that space underneath it to create that good convex concave relationship between the shoulder blade and the rib cage. And we look at thoracic rotation, we do see that in a lot of these populations, there's a tremendous amount of acquired thoracic mobility. A uh, pitcher on the left has some big league time. He's about 80 degrees of thoracic rotation actively on a lumbar locked rotation test. The one in the middle is an aspiring professional golfer. He's upwards of 90. I've seen players well over 90, which is superhuman and, and can create some problems. The individual on the left is a competitive power lifter, right? And he doesn't need a whole lot of thoracic extension and rotation to be a successful in his sport. And he also has a lot of tissue tone through quadratus lumborum, lats, pec major, that may actually create some soft tissue extensibility changes. The key takeaway from this though, is that in addition to some of those tissue extensibility changes, the angles, or excuse me, the, the positioning of the joints actually matter. We know that very kyphotic individuals will generally struggle to rotate. Just think of grandma carrying her grocery bags and winding up with a thoracic fracture um, when she looks to turn. If we appreciate what happens with a lot of these pitchers, they actually acquire excessive rotation through their thoracic spine because it's so hyperextended, because their adaptive changes have made it very upright, okay? So this is something we very commonly see. This is an individual who threw 100 miles an hour but didn't strike anybody out. What you see is a flat thoracic spine. You see shoulder blades that are aggressively pulling into retraction. So if we actually slow this down and look to find the pictures when he's actually at ball release, his shoulder blades actually haven't upwardly rotated at all, excuse me, to, to accommodate the position at which he gets to true layback. So I would actually define this as somewhat of a military posture. Everything is, is pulled back. Um, Joe gave some great ideas just in terms of sticky scaps. These are the guys where it's life-changing just to get some good manual therapy on rhomboids because that rhomboid is actually a downward rotator of the scapula and it'll pull folks too close towards the spine. So just like we would expect to see a scapular anterior tilt on an individual who's very kyphotic and rounded over, we may accept, expect to see excessive retraction in an individual with a very flat thoracic spine. So. Um, what you'll often see with these individuals is they're given the down and back cue, which is intended just to give them a little bit of posterior tilt of the shoulder blade. But in reality, what happens is they aggressively tug into retraction, or they may also really pull heavily into scapular depression and overuse lats. So it's a, it's a wise cue. It's just not effective in practice unless we really, really coach it intensely. And this is where I think we have to be so cognizant of the role of serratus anterior. Um, obviously, it has attachments on the medial border of the scapula and, and runs from ribs one through eight or nine, depending on the individual. So it has this broad impact on a wide variety of things. We know it protracts and, and helps to drive scapular upward rotation in conjunction with lower trapezius and upper trapezius. You know, we often forget that it creates an element of posterior tilt while preserving that convex concave relationship. You could say that the serratus anterior is really intimately linked in preserving the normal thoracic curvature. But what I think is really overlooked, and this is a deep dive that we won't necessarily go into too much depth on, is its impact on rib position. We think too much about what it does in the scapula, but if you actually look at where serratus anterior attaches in the front, 
it has direct attachments on the first and second ribs. This is what's getting cut out when we do thoracic outlet surgeries because it's too hard to remove a clavicle. What we're seeing in a lot of these throwers is an aggressive scapular depression where that AC joint brings the clavicle down. So you see a lot of downslope shoulders and horizontal clavicles as opposed to a nice upslope that allows for freedom of motion there. So we can do manual therapy on subclavius. We can treat lats. We can drive some scapular upward rotation to impact it from here and from here. But a lot of people don't realize that if you get good serratus anterior recruitment, you actually have a depressive effect on that first rib to mechanically create some space for those nerve and vascular structures that, you know, that arise from, from the brachial plexus and past the scalenes and, you know, before they run laterally underneath everything attaching to the coracoid process. So don't overlook serratus anterior as a, not only something that improves the, the thoracic spine positioning in these individuals, but also something that may reduce their susceptibility um, to, you know, to a thoracic outlet syndrome. And what we realized is there's an awareness thing. This is a nine year major league veteran. I actually took this video this morning as we were just doing some bear crawl variations. In his mind, he thinks that he has a good thoracic, uh, you know, kind of curvature to match up with his shoulder blades. And what you realize is that he's selling out for tons and tons of, of lumbar flexion and actually almost thoraco uh, lumbar flexion as well. He's not actually able to, to fill up this gap. So when, between these two pictures, I actually went right up and I put my sternum or my hand right on his sternum and I lifted him up away from the ground. These are positions that he should be able to get to at ball release. And he said, it feels totally foreign to him that it's, 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 it feels like he's completely rounded over in reality. All he is, is just establishing that snug relationship between the two. So um, when we have these individuals, we did a lot of work in quadruped where we learned to drive that scapula around the rib cage through serratus anterior and recreate some of that thoracic flexion. We'll do things like all fours belly lift, just positional breathing where we're, we're guiding the shoulder blades around the rib cage, learning to inhale and create some upper back expansion. As we exhale, we turn on you know, external obliques, rectus abdominis, and drive some posterior pelvic tilt in this population that is so heavily extended from, from top to bottom. We can use things like serratus anterior activation with the roller. I really like this drill because the roller keeps you honest. What will often happen is individual run out of the rotational component of scapular upward rotation. And instead they'll drive a lot of motion at the glenohumeral joint. So as soon as he gets to the point where his elbows are on the roller or about to come off the roller, I should say, you realize that he's probably maxed out the scapula thoracic motion and is probably gonna try to compensate through the glenohumeral joint. Also really like the idea of doing serratus wall slides with valve slides. Why? Your right serratus anterior actually can drive some thoracic rotation to the left if you really think about how the muscular recruitment patterns happen. So when we have an individual that has a hard time kind of feeling this in the right place, we'll add that rotation away from the working side. So I'll put my hands right along the inferior medial border and I'll guide it right around there and usually add a big exhale at the finish. It's hard because if we want someone to feel the biceps, we can put them in a you know elbow flex position, take them to maximal you know supination, add a little bit of shoulder flexion, and they'll get that cramping feeling. It's really hard to get that with serratus because your upper and lower fibers are doing different things. Full rotation around the rib cage isn't a natural feeling for folks, and then you also have to figure what's actually happening um, with respect to you know they're, are they fighting through shrugging patterns or anything along those lines. So, adding this rotational element is one way to make them feel it just a little bit more. Um, bear crawl is a way to get a little bit more dynamic. Again, we're monitoring what's happening to that inferior medial border. Is it getting around the rib cage or is it just staying put? Just like when you watch a push-up, you should see the shoulder blades actively moving into protraction at the top and retraction at the bottom. We expect to see a reaching component on this. I actually like reverse bear crawls a little bit more for our athletes. Um, one thing I'll actually do at times is I'll go right up and I'll put my hand right along the thoracic spine between the shoulder blades and I'll have them actively push up against me the entire time just to give them that little external focus cue to make it feel like it's a little bit more natural. We like short plank with reach across and under. You kind of have to move that, that hand out a little bit further to get motion. We also know serratus anterior is gonna be a little more active above 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. So we wanna preferentially recruit that instead of pec minor. So we're finding an element of posterior pelvic tilt. And as he gets to the end of his reach, we'll give him a big exhale. So here we're finding thoracic flexion with rotation. 
Not something you're probably going to be using with your, your grandfather rotator cuff repairs, but absolutely something that can tre have tremendous benefit for a lot of your young throwers who are, who are presenting with this extended posture. Um, likewise, think about how you coach some of your more global exercises. We see a lot of times where people will say, lock the, the scapula down when you do your rows. My feeling is when you do that, you wind up getting a lot of uh, excessive glenohumeral motion. So if I don't let the scapula move, I wind up grinding away on the front of the shoulder, particularly when the elbow gets a little further behind the body. On this, I'm actually cueing him to let the scapula come forward and around the rib cage. What I'll come up and I'll say to our pitchers while they're doing this exercise is I'll say, think glove side fastball, right? Brace into that front hip and learn to actually get that scapula to rotate around your rib cage as if you're trying to throw a fastball into a left-handed hitter here. And then we can get a little bit more dynamic, right? These are some of the things that we'll do on field with our guys, a rotational row with weight shift, where we're learning to integrate everything into that front hip. We want to, we talk about front hip pullback, taking those rotational patterns and making them a little bit more linear. He probably drifts a little bit further forward with that kneecap than I'd like, but in this case, it's allowing him to get a little bit more thoracic flexion, scapular upward rotation around the rib cage and in turn deliver the baseball in a healthier way that shared um, the stress over multiple joints. I thank you very much for your kind attention.